I went down and met the production manager, John Romain, who said, hey, you're the first one to show up. Let's go pick out your trailer. And I said, I have a trailer? What? He says, of course, you're a star, Gary. And I checked out, like, looked out the window, which, you know, from which trailer am I going to have the best view of Michael Jackson's trailer? If you're here for improv, go away. This is Comedy and Improv with Anthony Francis. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Other Than Improv. I'm your host, Anthony Francis. And my guest today has had their hand in a couple of movies. I'm going to name a few of the movies that they have had their their hand in that they've worked on the hard truth jack and the beanstalk american harmony slasher hansel and gretel the retrievers cowboys and angels the independent deal of a lifetime sinbad battle of the dark knights always say goodbye campfire tales children of the corn the gathering children of the corn three urban harvest a Kiss Goodnight, Angel 4 Undercover, The Last Job, The Willies, Fatal Skies. Did I miss anything? Probably. Probably. I think so. And a few more that we're going to talk about. Uh, but please welcome my guest today, Gary Depew. Hey, Gary. Hey, Anthony. Am I saying that correctly? Gary? De- yes. De- thank you. <laughs> yes, Gary Depew. Gary, you, uh, you, you recently started doing improv. Mm-hmm. You and I met because you came to a drop-in class. Yes. And uh, right away, I you were new to improv, but you you had you had something, and I was like, this guy's got something, but it's not improv, but it's something near improv. He's been near the magic in some way. You just kind of <laughs> have it. You have some sort of magic going on. You joined up with and did improv. We got to know you, and one night after class, you told me an incredible story uh, that really touched me personally because I am a huge fan of some of the work that you've done. Uh, some of the work I, I haven't seen, but I really need to see, and we're going to no, talk about You don't need to see I, it. No, I, I want to see it. There's some, there's some good stuff here. Uh, great, a lot of great stuff here. But um, you, you told some great stories, and I want to talk about that today. But for right now, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're at now, and kind of what got you doing improv. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I grew up in Southern California, in uh, San Diego, and then... Los Angeles for for school and most of my professional life up until just a, about two years ago um, made a uh, a move out to Florida um, with my husband and we came out here to uh, launch a business venture that I was working on and uh, I think the, for the first year it was pretty consuming and I wasn't really looking for any kind of creative outlet. It was just really focused on on business and, and getting situated here. And then uh, uh, about six months ago, um, I found some time on my hands and I really wanted to pursue some, some means of building a social network, um, making friends, and... Uh, Back in Los Angeles, I, I, I had a different creative outlet. I, I sang with a barbershop chorus for about 15 years. And I developed a, a whole sort of brotherhood, a whole fraternity. It wasn't a, it wasn't a quartet. It was a, a chorus of like 120, 130 guys. Uh, uh, and it happened to be um, like actually the best barbershop chorus in the world there's competitions and we, we we won every year okay number one in the world of course coming out here i considered getting back into barbershop but it's like you know i've had such a good experience with that it's just time to you know to do something new i like i like turning the page and doing something new this business i'm working on has nothing to do with the entertainment industry it has nothing to do with really much of anything that i i've done like been, except for in the last three years and it's great it's great to find a new passion to to build i love i love building that's awesome i want to talk a little bit about where we are here well a little bit about kind of just where our location we're in the office uh-huh. uh it's a beautiful office and i just want to mention this adorable floof 
that we have here, uh, Oka. Oka, yeah. And what is Oka? Oka is a uh, two-year-old Samoyed. If you don't know what a Samoyed is, it's about 20 pounds of dog and about 30 pounds of fur. And he's delightful. He's so well-behaved. He's just a joy. Well, that's wonderful. So if, if, if anyone hears any tapping around, uh, that's, that's just Oka being Oka. And, and we, we all, everyone appreciates that. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, cool. Well, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're down in South Florida doing improv with us. Tell us about your early years in the film industry. How did you get started as an actor? And then how did you end up as a producer? Wow. Well, growing up making, uh, making movies, making eight millimeter movies was a hobby that uh, my best friend and I uh, did all through high school. And um, we both uh, we went to high school together down in San Diego and then both went up to uh, Los Angeles to go to USC. I pursued business. I, I got a degree in, in business administration. He was in the uh, drama department. And virtually all of the friends that I made at USC were either in the cinema school or in the drama department. Business majors were not particularly interesting. But, you know, if you've been around the industry, there's a certain energy that people in entertainment tend to bring to the party. I found myself surrounded by a, so, so many talented people at USC. And here I was in the business school. And I was approached with the idea of, well, they, of making, a, making a film with some of the people that I had gone to school with. And prior to that, I had spent a summer, excuse me, not a summer, a semester at the USC program, business school program in Madrid, Spain. And following that semester, I went up to the south of France where the Cannes Film Festival was going on. And I attended the film festival, you know, on $15 a day, staying in a hostel. In that hostel, were a couple of guys that had made a movie. They were they lived like I think in Minnesota. They had made a, a movie for twenty thousand dollars, a ninety minute movie, and they sold it to Paramount Home Video for two hundred thousand dollars. And I'm a business major, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, ten x your investment doing something you love. That sounds more like a that sounds like a business. Maybe I should look into. <laughs> right. So when I got back to L. A. I said, you know that idea you guys are talking about? Yes, absolutely. I would love to. Let's do it. I had no idea what the process was. My experience was you pick up a camera and say, what should we shoot today? Long story short, we ended up, a friend that I went to high school with, Brian Peck, he and I made a movie together called The Willies. And we raised a little over $100,000 from his mom and somebody's doctor and somebody else's next door neighbor and we put to, we cobbled together this money and we made a 90 minute film uh, called the willies and we sold it to paramount home video for two hundred thousand dollars he had friends who were getting into the business of doing extra work walking around in the background there was a union for that it's called the screen extras guild and you know union rates it's a, like Ninety-eight dollars for uh, for an eight-hour minimum call. You get called, you're going to get ninety-eight bucks. Over time, you could easily make one hundred and fifty dollars in a day. And as a college student in the '80s, that was a lot of money. I learned that you get paid extra if you have an extra ability, special ability that they would call on. So, like if you could ride a horse, or if you could, uh, if you were good at bowling or playing baseball or whatever, all these different things. I was on the set of Quincy, TV show with uh, Jack Klugman. It was a medical show, and there were uh, some extras who were patients in the hospital. You know, there were amputees. Somebody had lost an arm, lost a leg. Yeah. And I learned that that's a special ability. Well, it turns out I'm an amputee. I, I, I'm missing uh, my lower part of my left leg. I mentioned that to an assistant director who I had known. She said, Gary, you've been, you've been doing this for six months. You had no idea. You, you could make so much more money if you just add, you know, you just check that box. It's like, wow, I finally get to check a box, you know? Why didn't you bring it up? My issue with my leg is like so not a part of who I am. It's not a part of my identity. I don't think about it. It's not like I try not to think about it. I just like really don't think about it much. It's an inconvenience, but it's a little more than that. When I learned that I could use that to make a little extra money, I thought, sure, why not? 
And then I started working every day. One of the films I did called Ice Pirates, they were looking for an amputee to play a peg-legged robot. Since you brought it up. Yeah. In a distant future, scarce of water, space pirates get caught after stealing ice from a spaceship. They are sold to a princess looking for her dad. He may have found a planet abundant with water. The Ice Pirates, starring Robert Urich, Mary Crosby, and Michael D. Roberts. This, this is a horrible, horrible, horrible movie. Don't sugarcoat it, Gary. I want to know how you really feel about this movie. The director, uh, Stuart Raffel, apparently hates human beings. And the only thing he hates more than human beings are extras. <laughs> Several of us robots, we would be under attack all the time. So we were being fired upon by some lasers. We didn't see the lasers, but they planted these little explosives all over our costumes that would go off. No one paid attention to the fact that these little explosions on freshly painted suits, the suits we were wearing were thick rubber suits. Um, we caught on fire multiple times. Oh my multiple God. times the suits would catch on fire. And somebody with a you know, special effects team would come and like literally spray us with, with uh, fire extinguishers. They would repaint us while we were, you know, spray paint us while we were still in the suits. And then we would just go again. Oh, my God. Over and over and over. Yeah. God. Cut. Put them out. Back to one. And you're in a rubber suit. Yeah. So you're sweating. It's awful. Did anyone go to the hospital? The one guy went to the hospital because he flipped out. He got super... He tore off his suit. He threw it down and destroyed uh, dis de destroyed the ca uh, the camera fell over. The guy just kicked the, kicked the camera and he... Flew into a rage. I don't know what happened to him. Wow. But seriously, it was it was bad. Best thing about that movie is that it was shot on stage 29 at MGM, which is the same stage that The Wizard of Oz was shot on. Wow. And in the corner of stage 29, it was the set for Poltergeist, for Carol Ann's room. And when, it's, when it spins and twists, it was, on, it was an enormous gimbal. There was an enormous gimbal on stage 29 at that, you know, being a big Spielberg fan and seeing the, seeing the poltergeist gimbal was kind of cool. And now you're acting. Yes. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about that acting career. Where does that, where does that lead you? I, I never, uh, I was never, I don't think I was ever been paid as an actor. I, the closest I came was, uh, on, uh, I, I did the final episode of MASH, by the way. The final episode of MASH, um, I worked as an amputee. And I got to know Bert Metcalf, who was the producer, who's the kindest, one of the kindest people I've, I, I ever met in the business. And he, he mentioned that right after that, we were going to do a... Uh, uh, they, they were doing something called After MASH. It was going to be another TV series based on some of, some of the return characters. And he asked me to come in and read for a, a recurring role on Aftermash. And I thought, oh my God, this is awesome. And I went in and I read and he, he said, um, he said, I think we can make this work. I'm not really sure we can make this work, Gary. So he actually, they, they gave me screen tests. They gave me like two or three tests and I, I was, I'm a terrible actor. So it didn't. It didn't work out. But I got my, I got my reading for Burt Metcalf. At, okay. After Mash, but no, I uh, I did extra work for the money and for the fun, and I met a lot of great, uh, a lot of great folks through that, and and I became um, registered in uh, within Screen Extras Guild, which at some point merged with the Screen Actors Guild as an amputee, and I would continue to get calls. Uh, for for work from time to time, and that led to um, the story that I had told you about. Sure. With uh, playing a playing a peglay robot in another movie. Right. Well, let's uh, I, before we get to that, I do want to ask um, you, or I want to I want to say you you mentioned uh, you acted and you you had fun and you had a good time. Is that the frame of mind you like to keep when it comes to that sort of thing? I mean. A lot of people are like, I'm going to be an actor and that's going to be my job. And, and what, what, I guess, what advice would you give to a, a new actor who, who's entering? What would you say to them? Wow. I'm not sure that I'd be, I'm, I'm not sure I would have anything encouraging to say. 
it is such a tough business and so many people would gladly work for free if they if someone would just pay their own pay their bills they would work seven days a week you know because it's because when you're working in the entertainment industry it's long hours it's brutal there's some awful awful people some great great people but a lot of really awful people but it's just fun it's just fun when you are on set You've prepped for the shot, you've rehearsed the shot, and it's finally time to go. And the camera goes on, and it sounds cliche, but it's magic. It's just simply magic. The, the, whole world's, the whole world freezes, and you are in this magic space for 20 seconds, two minutes, five minutes. If you're lucky enough to work with really talented people, and I have to say, I have been really, really lucky in that regard, there's nothing like it. And I would pay money to do it. You wouldn't have to pay me to do that. I would pay money to do that. Yet, uh, unless, uh, unless you come to the, you know, come to the industry with, you know, independently wealthy, it's really, really tough to compete with, with that and make a living at it. A lot of people have natural gifts. Those gifts have to be polished and it takes a lot of practice to get good at some stuff. And just like with any art that Hopefully, the, you know, the, the, the more you're at it, the better you get. And so if you're coming in new, you need to make a living. You have to probably work 30 hours a, a week doing something to pay the bills. And then in that extra time, you've got to get so good that you'll compete with the people who would, you know, it's just really tough. It's not just magic for the actors. It's also magic for the people doing hair and makeup and building sets and, and driving trucks they all love the industry too. They all, they all come to the set when the camera's rolling. They all want to be part of that. It's not just the shot to your ego, you know, of being like I'm the center of things. Yeah. There, if there's someone in front of the camera, there's sixty people that aren't in front of the camera that are still in the room, and they're all having the same experience. It's a great business when you're working, and when you're not working. And this goes top to bottom, pretty much, you know, whether it's your first film or whether it's your 50th film. When that film ends, you just never know if you're ever going to work again. You just don't, you just don't know. You can, you can say, well, yeah, I've been doing it. I know several people. And of course, I'm on the, you know, uh, I've, got a, I've got some momentum going. But there's no guarantee that come Monday morning, the phone's going to ring or come March or April or June or December that, that the phone's going to ring. So there were times that I would go periods of time where I did four films back to back, like finish on Saturday night and on Monday morning, I'm on the next project. And there's times when I've gone a year and a half without a paycheck because I can't get a job. And it's that roller coaster that is the hardest part it was for me it was the hardest part of the business was the financial roller coaster. And that's why I eventually um, moved on to something else. You're auditioning and you get to an audition. They're looking for someone to play a robot, as you mentioned before. Let's, mm. let's talk about that. What's, what's that like? I go to this address, it's a house, and I walk into the front room and there's, it's packed. No one was taller than about three and a half feet except me. And I thought, oh, I'm just really, I. There's been some kind of mistake. There's a girl with a clipboard, and I said, "Hi, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm Gary. I don't think I'm in the right room." And she said, "Oh, um, well, you may be. Uh, are you? Are you miss? Uh, do you not have?" And I said, "Yes, I, I'm missing, and I don't have." And she said, "Oh, okay, okay, great. Just go to, to go down the hall, the last room on the right." And I go down the hall, and it's just like it's a house. In there is a room, there's three sofas, a couple of chairs, and there's nine older guys. They all look like war vets, to be honest, you know? A couple of guys on crutches, a couple of guys wearing their prosthesis, some people not wearing their prosthesis, but they're all, every one of them is missing a leg. So I thought, oh, okay, now I'm in the right room. I don't think I'd ever been in a room with nine amputees in my life, but, but there I was. And uh, I was asking them what this is about. They go, oh, something for Disney, something for Disney. Nobody knew a thing. And I was the last one to arrive, so I'm, you know, the last one to go in. So I, I'm sitting there by myself, and finally somebody comes in and said, Gary, Gary DePew? And I said, yeah, come on in. 
And I went in and uh, it was sort of dark, uh, dark in the room. And somebody greets me at the door, a guy with a beard. He says, hi, I'm George. Thank you. Sorry to keep you waiting. It's been a long day. Can, did you get, they offer you some water? Are you okay? Do you need anything? It's only going to be about 10, 15 minutes. And he's like the nicest guy. And I thought for a moment, he's really familiar. And I, that's, that was George Lucas offering, making sure that I was okay. And I thought, oh, wow. Yeah, I, 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 I'm suddenly very, 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 very interested in this job. So uh, he said, okay, well, um, we're just going to ask you to go down to that end of the room and stand in front of that screen. And it's okay if we're, we're going to film you just, you know, back in the day, slate, you know, look at the camera and slate your name. And uh, we're just going to ask you some questions. And, um, oh, uh, let me introduce you. This is our director, Francis. And I looked at it. It's Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, what do you do? You know, you're a, a lover of cinema in the 80s. And you're in a room with Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas. And you're auditioning for something. And uh, it's like wow, this is just crazy. This movie business is just absolutely insane. Dreams like this. I and mean, where, where else does this happen? Yeah, amazing. So uh, I said, I don't know what you guys want, but I, I'm ready. Whatever you need, I, I'm going to do it. And they said, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a film for Disney. It's going to be a short film. And um, it's going to be in 3D. And we need somebody to uh, play a peg leg robot and I said oh my god I, I have so much experience playing a peg leg robot and I said I've gone through it and I know that uh, I said it was miserable but I was the guy that kept showing up I never missed a day and they said well we're you know we're going to keep you comfortable George said I've you know I've a lot of experience with character costumes you know do your best robot walk back and forth and um is there anything you want to ask they, and I, I couldn't see very well because the, the lights lights in my eyes. I'm at one end of the room. The, end of the other end of the room is a table, and there there are clearly uh, three people there, maybe four. And, and this is George Lucas George yelling Lucas, back to someone. Yeah, George Lucas is actually turning to somebody next to him and saying, "Is there anything you want to ask?" And this thin voice, kind of girly voice, says, "Can can you dance?" I said, no, I, I mean, I can, I can, I can sort of dance. I'm not like a dancer dancer, but I mean, I can move to move to music. He said, okay, well, there's going to be a lot of music in this. And so we might ask you to, to, to dance a little bit. Are you comfortable with that? And I said, yeah, I'll be comfortable with that. Are you at this moment, are you playing it cool or are you absolutely just, are you like, I'll do whatever you guys need me to do? Like I mean, I, what's going on in your head right now? What are I, you thinking? I'm thinking, I don't want to. I don't want to tell them I can do something that I can't, I actually can't do, but I, I want to be as um, agreeable as possible. And as I'm looking, I'm looking over the table, for, I think it was Francis that said, oh, Gary, this is, uh, this is Michael. And I look, and I think, that's fucking Michael Jackson. <laughs> that's Michael Jackson. And it's what, 80, it's mid 80s, 80s, 80? Yeah, uh, that's... Yeah, he's he's superhuman at this point. Right. He's basically like the unofficial president of the United States. I mean, who, he's Michael Jackson in the '80s. It's it doesn't get better than that. What do you, what do you do? What are you thinking when you see this? When you see him? Um, I don't think I think my brain fell out. I I, yeah. I don't think I was thinking anything. I, I that was just overwhelming. And um, I do know I do remember going up to the table and shaking everybody's hands and saying. I am so the perfect person for this role, and um, and I and I was throwing the other people like under the bus. I was saying, I'm going to be honest with you. I saw the other several of the other guys that were here, and I'm young, and I'm uh, 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 I, I can take it. You can throw me down the stairs, and I will cl I will crawl back up the stairs, and we'll do it again and again and again. I. You, you can hurt me and I'll keep coming back. I didn't know what else to say. I mean, like, no, that's probably what I would have said too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's really about as much as I recall saying. And I left. I have no idea how I got home. I don't remember. 
I, but I, I certainly called everybody I knew and told them that I had met Michael Jackson. So did you dance, though? Did you dance for Michael oh, Jackson? I s- sort of bopped back and forth, you know, from leg to leg. But it wasn't... I think George saved me. I think George said, you know, there's going to be quite limited motion in this in the suit. So, and, and you're, you know, because your arms are going to be crossed, the, the chest is so big. I remember this. He, that you're going to be very top heavy, and the, and the, what we're worried about is if you start to fall, you're not going to be able to put your hands out to stop. I, th- I think he was, you know, he was saying, "Don't worry, there's not going to be a lot of dancing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for this, for this, for this character." That's incredible. Um, well, Gary, thanks so much. It was great talking to you. Uh, yeah. Oh wait, sure. is there more? <laughs> there's more. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I got a call the next day from Beverly Long, and she said, "Gary, I don't know what you did, but they want you." Awesome. Then it was not long before I was given my call, my call time. I went down and met the production manager, John Romaine, who said, hey, you're the first one to show up. Let's go pick out your trailer. And I said, I have a trailer? What? He says, of course, you're a star, Gary. And I checked out, like, looked out the window, which, you know, from which trailer am I going to have the best view of Michael Jackson's trailer? That sounds right. That's that sounds I right. I chose that trailer. I've got a couple specific questions on that. And for those that don't know about Captain E, about this movie, uh, which it, I guess it was a movie, right? We would call it a, a movie or a short? What would well, you... I would call it, a, but, you know, it, what you call a movie um, has a lot to do with how much you end up having to pay the actors. If you call it a commercial versus a short film, I'm blanking on the term. It's like a corporate film. Okay. Where it's a film that is only going to be shown on company premises. Yeah, industry? Industrial. Industrial yeah, film. Yeah, industrial ah, film. Thank okay. you. Interesting. Yeah, That's, thank you. So Captain EO is technically considered an industrial film. Yes, because it's only shown on company property. Wow. So That's why. It's, it's, so you've got, you've got Captain EO and some guy in a suit explaining the, the TXR 3000. These are both in the same category. <laughs> right. Right? That's fascinating exactly. to me. Yeah, so it's an industrial film. Uh, <laughs> And so long as it's never, so long as it was never um, released as a uh, on home video or you know or or shown in theaters or released on network television, ah, now they would never have to pay residuals. Okay, 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 interesting. So just so to let everyone know, if you didn't know this, at the Disney theme parks. Captain EO starring Michael Jackson and Angelica Houston and Gary DePew. It was Disney's first 4D movie. It's a 3D movie, but it also had lasers and smoke that would come into the theater during parts of the movie, which makes it a 4D film, I believe. I'm assuming that. I don't have any background on that. It starred Michael Jackson, was produced by George Lucas, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. It ran at Disney World's Epcot from 1986 to 1994. And then again from 2010 to 2015 as a tribute to Michael Jackson after his death. And only once was it aired. It was aired on MTV in 1996, and it's never been officially released in any home format. You do this movie, you, or you do this industrial film. Right, industrial you, film. You, you do Captain EO. Uh, there's a couple of little facts that I found that I wanted to ask you about. It had an estimated budget of over $17 million. It was 17 and change. Okay, because you're the finance guy. Not in well, this. Not in that. But 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 you, you do have this on, background. Years later, years later, I got a hold of the budget. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to talk about the Captain EO budget for a second. It cost it, it, Captain EO cost over a million dollars a minute, making it one of the most expensive short films ever made. Is that true? I don't know. I don't. I don't track those things. But okay. All right. I, think, All right. I didn't know if you had that. In that. Yeah. If you buy the four D the- a four D movie, then I guess you can buy that as well. Right. Uh, and then the last, the last little fact I want to check with you is to portray the supreme leader, who is the, the the bad guy in the in the movie. Angelica Houston had to endure three hours of makeup daily and had to be suspended from the ceiling by cables. Yes. And another fun little fact in Star Trek, uh, when they have the Borg uh, and the um, I forget the film, but she comes down on cables. They say mm-hmm. that was inspired by that, but. Um, Apparently, rumor has it, Michael made um, Angelica Houston stay in her makeup every day, even when they weren't shooting her scenes. He, he would ask her to stay in character. Ah. Because he, uh, he's a method actor. And the, and the makeup was so elaborate that it, uh, it would have been too time-consuming to remove and 
put back on. It wasn't just makeup. The suit was kind of like a, you know a face sucker kind of a, a suit where the, te- the she had tentacles everywhere. She didn't really have feet. That's why she had to be suspended. She's more more like sort of an octopus lady. That's been you know that 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 descends from all of these all this you know black and silver piping and smoke. She comes down, but she didn't really have legs, so she wouldn't be able to. That's why she is on cabling. And yeah, her her costume was really elaborate, really elaborate. And not not only did did they have to put her in, you know, in the costume, but then in the makeup and then in the cabling and then the cabling had to be tied into the set. So she was just kind of, you know, really connected. Tell us what happens next now. You've, you've worked on this. What happens now? After about three months of editing. Oh, by the way, when, when, um, when we were shooting this, Francis also had a trailer right outside, an Airstream trailer that he worked out of where it was an editing suite because he was um, in the middle of post-production of, Mary Sue got Betty Sue got married. He was in post production of that, so he was always cutting that. Every break we had, he w- he would go in, uh, except at lunch when we would go in and everybody would put on these three D glasses to watch the dailies. That was pretty. That oh, was pretty awesome. cool. But roughly three months later, after we wrapped principal photography, I got a call that they needed to do some pickups, some additional photography. Francis was not available. Walter Murch. I think has an Oscar for editing. I don't think he's much known as a director. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But Walter Murch directed the the second unit or the pickups. They had just a small part of the of the set that uh, was recreated for the very end, where the characters all sort of dance off the set at the end. My character was called Major Domo, and there was another character called Minor Domo, which was like a little drone, like a mini me that would nestle on my back that was his home base where he would you know come and recharge then he would you know fly around the set and then come back all that was cgi but there was actually a minor domo that i i had a a costume with minor domo that was removable there wasn't actually a little physical minor domo for 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 pickups but when we went to do the the dance off they couldn't find the the minor domo that fits on my back so all there was was the was you know, this big black space. And as I'm dancing away from camera, there there was, they wanted all the characters there. So I heard a conversation with Walter and one of the assistant directors. They said, well, do we really need Major Domo in this? I mean, you know, maybe he can't dance away from camera if we can't see his back. So what, what, I, I don't know. You guys, you know, figure something out. Maybe we'll just see his shoulder or something. Let's we can block him with somebody else. And I didn't want to be blocked, and I didn't want to be miss that scene. So I got creative, and I went around. I like walked around that stage. You know, you have all sorts of garbage around the stage, and there's a. You know, I found a popcorn tub, like a cardboard popcorn tub, and I flipped it upside down. And I went to the art department, and I I spray painted it silver with you know silver and black. I'm not very artistic, but I I did that. And then for a head, I looked and looked and looked for something that was just the right size, like the, the, the size of a large potato. I couldn't find anything. And I had an idea and I went to the, I went into the bathroom and lifted the back of the toilet and I took the, plun- the, the ball from the toilet. Oh my God. And it was just the right size. And I stuck that on top of the popcorn bucket and I spray painted that and that's, that's what was used. And that's in the mo- yeah, that's, that's in it. it. That's in it. That's just so that I could be on camera. That's awesome. Yeah. That's incredible. After Captain EO, uh, there was a documentary being made about Captain EO. And uh, I was being interviewed. It was a sort of a making of. And the director of that and I kind of hit it off. I let her know that I, I just... I, I was finishing up my degree at, at USC as a business major and um, not really pursuing a career in, in, in acting or you know, hoping to end up in entertainment, but not really sure what I was going to do. And she said, well, I have a business doing behind the scenes documentaries, mockumentaries and documentaries. And she said, I could sure use an assistant. And I was like, that would be great. Right after we wrapped the, the pickups 
I went to work for her working in post-production on the on the making of Captain EO, which turns out to be what they would show at the park as you're standing in line to go into Captain EO. They have these monitors and they would show this eight minute clip, which I edited and I made sure that I got plenty of screen time um, for myself on, on that. And we did behind the scenes documentaries on a bunch of independent films, all you know, pretty forgettable stuff. Brian and I would sneak onto the studio lots all the time, trying to get on as extras. And if we couldn't get on as extras, we would go eat at the commissary. <laughs> and I uh, started knocking on doors for, at production companies on the lot and giving up my resume. You know, I'm a business student at USC, and I, you know, made a little short film that we, you know. But you've worked but at I, this point. You've worked with George and Francis and Michael. So yeah, I was uh, I was an extra in an industrial film. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have lines in Captain Neo. You know, um, uh, it didn't really count for much, and it, it wasn't even out yet. So it didn't mean it. It didn't like you know didn't turn Hollywood on its ear. Interesting. It was, you 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 were you were so just, like I said you yeah. know you never know when you're going to work again. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. Like, wow. I would have thought that was it. I thought that was it. You made it. Yeah. So I was passing out resumes and I was at a company called The Lad Company, which had made The Right Stuff and it was just amazing. I love The Right Stuff. Such a great movie. Coming through the lobby as I was talking to the receptionist, the woman said, are you, did I hear you looking for a job? I said, looking for a job. She goes, well, I could use an assistant. I'm starting a, I'm directing a TV um, pilot on Monday. Are you available? And I said, yeah, I'm available. And I started working with her. That was a, a show called Square Pegs for CBS. And I was the personal assistant to the director for the only two seasons of that, of that series. And that's when I think I mentioned to you that um, Sarah Jessica Parker, she started in Annie on Broadway when she was that age. But this is right. now 10 years later. Pre-Hocus Pocus. This is before Pre-Hocus Hocus Pocus. Pocus. Yeah, okay. she's like 16 years old now and just moved out from New York for this TV show. Your job as a personal assistant to a TV director is like, as a personal assistant, is just to do anything that nobody else wants to do, which included teaching Sarah how to drive a car so that she could get her license in California. You taught Sarah Jessica Parker how to drive. I did. I did. She was a natural. I got a call from John Romain, the production manager from Captain EO, who I stayed in touch with. And he said, so um, Michael's going to be doing a... Um, follow-up to Thriller and you were a business major thinking maybe you could come to work in the you know in the production office maybe in the accounting department and I said I'd love to do that he was like have you have you done any production accounting I said of course I have of course I have which of course I have every time you say it twice you know it's true (laughs) once for them once for me yeah (laughs) and I uh, had a friend who was a production accountant and I hired her to come in in the evenings and teach me how to do the job. So, and she did that every 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 night for about two weeks. She taught me how to be a production accountant. Well, wow. during the day, I just pretended I, I I knew what I was doing. But I sat with Michael's manager Frank DeLeo and John and Dennis Jones, the producer of what was Smooth Criminal. It was going to be a fifteen-minute video based on the song Smooth Criminal. And uh, that grew and grew and grew. It started out as 15 minutes, and then it was 20 minutes, and then it was 30 minutes, and then by the time we were done, it was nearly 45 minutes, and it was a year and a half. I'd been hired for six weeks, and I, I, worked, I worked on Smooth Criminal for a year and a half. And at that point, Michael had used all of his own money to produce it, and it was too much money to recoup from the record company. So they were looking at how else could they monetize it other than just a music video. And they came up with the idea of uh, just continuing to build it out with more Michael stuff and release it as a 90-minute project, which ultimately became Moonwalker. So So a year and a half on Smooth Criminal, and then another year and a half doing the rest of Moonwalker. So for three years, I started out as the fake accountant, uh, and then I became the real production accountant. And then I, when they did that deal from changing from Smooth Criminal to to Moonwalker, 
I became the production manager. In order to do that, I had to get approved and accepted into the Directors Guild, of which I'm still a member. And that final year and a half working with Michael and his team as not just a guy in the back, but like as one of the, you know, I don't want to say the, the, the real decision makers because I, I had no like creative responsibility, but as a production manager, you are uh, you have a lo- lot of responsibility for the um, turning the, the script uh, and the script changes into a, a schedule and then a budget and then hiring staff, hiring crew, renting stages, building sets, and then delivering all of that. This movie is... Michael Jackson, he's running through this field with a bunch of kids, these three amazingly talented actors. You don't know the backstory. You don't need the backstory. It's a, it's freaking great. And it's just nuts from beginning to end. And I promise I'm not going to wax about it for more than an hour. Oh, please, wax. Um, oh, yeah, you want to hear the wax? Because yeah, yeah. I have so much wax on this movie, sir. Uh, so it just starts, which is great as a movie, because it just starts. At one point, Michael Jackson turns into a car then he turns into a giant robot. Joe Pesci's in it, and he's just a drug dealer. He's a <laughs> drug dealer. He's like, I just want to cover the world in drugs. Oh, he's got this one part where he turns the globe, and the globe is covered in tarantulas. There's a magic to it. Okay, I'm done. I'm not done, but I'm going to stop here. <laughs> okay. The small connection that you may or may not be aware of is that the, the special effects team that built the car that Michael turns into was headed by Kevin Pike of Film Tricks who built the car for Back to the Future. That's awesome. No wonder. DeLorean. I remember there were three of them. Kevin built three of them. They were actually built? Oh, they are physical? Yeah. One, <clears throat> one could, and each one had a, had a different function. Uh, one could actually drive, um, but could only go straight. Another one could like only turn. And then one was, was very, very lightweight. And it was the one we put on cables and flew over the back lot at Universal Studios. Michael Jackson is backed into an alley. The kids are watching from the rooftops. They don't know what's going to happen. And then all you see is the shadow of Michael Jackson. And then he just, his knees bend and they turn and he turns into a car and you only see the shadow. And this car is angry. No, now you're waxing. I am. Storyboards for that whole sequence were done by a very, very prolific comic book illustrator, Michael Plug. A lot of talent on that, uh, on that stage. How integral was... Michael in the in the storyboarding in the building of these very, concepts very 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 so this comes like, from his mind or Michael would sit down with with Plug and um, would say and then and Plug would tell these stories Plug was he was a heavy drinker and he would come in wild stories about uh, then Michael ah Michael and he said then I'm going to turn into a this and then I'm going to turn into a car and then I'm going to fly away and I'm going yeah okay <laughs> and he was like dry, you know. He, he every day, um, Pluke would come up with you know, you know, ten ten more storyboards. And we had uh, the the main production office had an entire wall of eight and a half by eleven storyboards from like ceiling to floor, just covered the entire like forty foot wall of storyboards, and they were always being changed, always being changed. Every time Michael showed up. Plug would be staying late and you know, doing more storyboards. But yeah, Michael was uh, dream- dreaming it all up. Amazing. Yeah. People that would show up, people that would come visit Michael on the set, uh, Elton John and David Bowie and Elizabeth Taylor and um, his his brothers and sisters. Did you get to meet Janet Le- Jackson? Did you meet Janet oh, Jackson? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Met Lady Diana. Wow. On the set. Yeah, it's crazy. So then you go on to create movies. So as an independent film producer in that day, it's really about making product for the, you know, for the channel or for the, you know, whoever the buyer is. The average uh, studio picture is produced at that time for, you know, I think 45, 45, 48 million dollars was the average budget. Now it's, I have no idea what it is today. But the low-budget contract this for the, under the Screen Actors Guild, if you wanted to pay actors the low-budget rate, which is all you could, you know, we could afford to do, so it was, it was basically like the TV movie um, budget, which is $2.2 million. So we would have to make a movie for like one-twentieth 
the cost of what the competition was. So how do you do that? And and make a movie that anybody's going to want to see. So you have to get you have to get you know uh, at least two recognizable stars, and uh, and get them attached to the picture. And then you then you try to get pre-sales. So you get someone to to uh, to fund fifty percent of the budget, and then do pre-sales from the from the foreign sales. Typically, in order to get a star to do your movie, you have to offer them something that the studios are not offering them. So, if they're a dramatic actor, you have to offer them a comedy. If they're a comedic, you have to offer them. You know, so you're kind of casting against, going against type. You could afford to shoot 18 days, which is three six-day weeks. Shoot five pages a day, five and a half six pages a day, and to get a 90-page script, it's like this whole logistical sort of math problem that your script would have to be able to be broken into a schedule you know that can be achieved and you only want to probably pay your lead actors for maybe you know five to ten days at the most of, uh, days of work over that 18 day schedule so it's sort of reverse engineering a script and it and at that point you know there are other producers who what their magic was was pitching they have an idea, and they would just pitch this idea, and and then tell the studio, yeah, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be able to, we're gonna make this for two and a half million dollars, and they either get laughed out of the room, or somebody says, okay, well, you know, here's your two and a half million dollars, and you know, every once in a while, they would actually complete the picture and, and get it done. For me, it was, uh, for me, it was always really about coming in on schedule and on budget. So the films that. I was able to get financed were typically very, very genre films. So like a teen comedy or a horror film or a low budget action picture. Those weren't at all the kinds of films I wanted to make, but those are the films that I knew how to get made. I knew how to get them financed. What'd you want to make? Um, I wanted to make Chariots of Fire. I wanted to make the right stuff. You know, I really wanted to make biographical pictures about inspirational people true stories when those are done well boy i i just really you know i really I, I really admire those people that that make those but to do that well on an 18 day shoot you know it's just like I, I don't know how to do that i have no idea how to do that i don't know who who does that well and being around being around all the crafts people all the you know the writer the director the editor the the the, the, the cast just being, you know, part of the circus for, you know, six months at a time on each picture, that's, a, you know, that's enough payoff. The key is to, you know, hopefully make enough money that you can last until you can get the next movie, not just dreamed up and written and cast and scheduled and financed before you're going to get your first dollar. Because, you know, so you can spend easily a year putting that package together before you get paid anything. It's like starting a business. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much exactly like starting a business. It's, you know, being an independent producer is like being a serial entrepreneur where you put your thoughts together, put the numbers together, put the people together, put the financing together, and then go out and pitch it. Is there one film that, you, uh, that you've made that you're most proud of that you would say... If you're going to see anything I've, I've, I've had my hand in, go see this. What would that be? It would probably be American Harmony. Um, mm -hmm. and that was a documentary um, about barbershop, um, about barbershop music. And I, want to, I want to watch that. I'm probably the most proud of that, and I have to uh, acknowledge that I, I had the least to do with that creatively. And even logistically, my current business partner and I, um, Russ Squires, I honestly don't remember whose idea it was. It wasn't mine. It might have been Russ's, or it might have been this guy uh, Angus, who is Angus and and uh, can't remember Angus's last name. But he and his partner, um, business partner Colin Miller, really get the credit for the creative part of that. But Russ and I worked with Colin and Angus in putting the financing together. And that's why my credit on that film, I believe, is executive producer. Because the executive producer is usually someone who is kind of a kingmaker, you know, someone who's able to put the major pieces together. But American Harmony is a really good film about this subculture 
a barbershop quartet co competing. And it's actually a pretty good model for, um, a, I don't know if there's been one, but if there was to be a film about improv, it, you, you might want to look at, at American Harmony and see how they did that. And because it's really behind the scenes of various quartets getting ready for a competition and then what happens to them during the competition and then coming back the next year. And, and this is a documentary, it's not a documentary, a, not it's a mockumentary. A, no, not a, it's, okay. it's real, real, real story real about real people. I think we, we started following, you know, three or four times as many quartets as ultimately are in the final picture. But I like it because it works well as a story um, and it really works well thematically. It, it has a lot to say about how music brings people together and the friendly competition and, and how really just average you know, average Joes within their subculture can become rock stars. Just, you know, but just within that subculture. Well, I do want to say this before we go, you know, you telling the story about how you got started in this career and, and what you've done. I'm not surprised because you, you started by making a movie and you, you put all the effort and the energy into it. And you're, you, you're focused on, on, on the business side of it. And you, you had a, you, I feel like you had your head screwed on right when you went into it. And I'm not surprised you ended up in a room with some of the biggest names in, in Hollywood because you're, you, you're coming correct. Uh, it seemed like from start, from the start, from, from enjoying and loving the theater or loving, loving the, the movie making process and, and eight millimeter making those films and everything. It's, it's really, really interesting. Anything you want to, uh, anything else you want to share or plug or anything like that? Got an improv show coming up that we can uh, watch? Or? Uh, no, I do not. But maybe one day. All right. Well, look out for Gary on your on an improv stage near you. And if you want, I guess you can go watch the many films he's made. But his improv is really good. I highly recommend it. Thanks, Anthony. Gary, pleasure. Thank you so much, man. Yep. If you're here for improv, go away. This is my